Okay. Good morning, dear friends. Today we are going to discuss the most common uh, type of anemia, that is the iron deficiency anemia. For this, we have Dr. Jagdish Chandra sir with us. He is professor of pediatrics at ESIC Medical College and Hospital at Fridabad. Uh, earlier, he was the director of the Lady Harding Medical College uh, and the head of the department at Lady Harding Medical College and ESI Basai Darapur also. He worked at LHMC from uh, March 87 to August 2020. And uh, he was the director from March 2016 to October 2017. He is the chairperson of the hemoglobin hemoglobinopathy and other red cell disorder committee of PHO. And he was also chairperson Hodgkin lymphoma study group from 2014 to 2017. And he received RV Lokeshwar oration of PHO chapter. And uh, he uh, also Shri Har Bhagwan Kumar memorial oration in 2021. He was conferred Dr. B. N. Dara Award by National Thalassemia Welfare Society. And he has published more than 200 papers and written various chapters in various books. So we welcome Dr. Jigdish Chandra, sir. And I request Dr. Jigdish Chandra, sir, to please begin his presentation. Please ask your questions in the question answer box. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ajay and Dr. Vipul for organizing this uh, certificate course in hematology and uh, as we learn from the the feedback that we have received people are joining in large numbers and they are getting benefited from this so um, and we have already had two very wonderful sessions uh, one on the cbc and the other on approach to anemia and part of my talk has already been discussed by both the speakers in earlier two sessions so uh, we'll, uh, as it has been introduced that this is one of the commonest cause of anemia, the word over in fact. So uh, we are talking about iron deficiency anemia, its diagnosis, treatment, and also the prevention of uh, this condition. So just to capture the attention of uh, the audience, this is the list of national programs that we are running or we uh, are into the programs for almost 50 years, you can say starting with 1970 to the Anemia Mukh Bharat in 2018. And we are hardly near, uh, anywhere near the Anemia Mukh Bharat, so to say. And because NFHS 5 survey, which was uh, 2019 to 21 showed that from the NFHS 4, that is National Family Health uh, Survey of uh, 2015 to 16, where the under five anemia prevalence was to the tune of 58 percent, it increased to 67 percent, and that's a quite disturbing figure. So, uh, anemia continues to be a problem, though this uh, comprehensive national nutrition survey showed a slightly lower prevalence at 41 percent in under four years, but Important to note that etiology of anemia is nutritional in large number of uh, patients. That is, under four years, 68-69% per, anemia is nutritional, 50% in five to nine years, and about again, uh, in the adolescent years, 65% is on account of nutritional causes. And iron deficiency is the common in under five years, while folate deficiency and B12 deficiency becomes higher in uh, uh, in uh, uh, patients who are school going in children school going as well as adolescent age group. This is just to highlight again in adolescent you can see the prevalence of iron deficiency measured by uh, ferritin assay of less than 12 nanogram per ml. You can see in all uh, high income group and let me take out the pointer. Uh, so uh, high income group, middle income group and low income group across all uh, uh, classes we have very high prevalence of iron deficiency. And um, how much iron deficiency contributes to preventable anemia? This, the figure had been earlier to the tune of 40 to 50 percent. It was considered that iron folate supplementation will take care of the anemia. But the CNNS survey had thrown a light on uh, the, the anemia, which could be corrected by iron folate supplementation is not to that uh, extent, maybe it's about, say, you can see here in this uh, bar diagram, the, the red bottom portion is anemia and iron deficient, and the green portion, uh, the third block is iron deficient, but not anemic. So you can see that 
around 30% in this age group under four years, five to nine years, almost 10% plus 6%, 16%, and almost 20% in the older age group. This is preventable by iron, iron supplementation. So all the same, whatever, whether it is 25% or 50%, it appears to be the commonest cause of anemia in our country as well as the, the world over. So just looking at what are the causes of iron deficiency common, this list is nowhere uh, near a complete list. I'm sure many PGs who are in the audience, they would be able to give you more number of causes, but this list, the important causes that we should remember. Mostly it is the dietary deficiency, which is related to poverty and undernutrition, cultural practices, lack of knowledge and lack of health concerns, because of which there is excessive consumption of animal milk. Several of you might have noticed that children who are being normal for the age, say at one year of age, they weigh about 8.5 to 10 kgs, but they consume milk to the tune of maybe one liter or more, and because of that, they come with a hemoglobin of five to six grams. So in an adolescent age group, the food fats and junk foods, they are more common causes of anemia because of dietary deficiency. The other important cause is unmet increased requirements. We are all familiar with this. The low birth weight and premature babies, they need to be supplemented. And if they are not supplemented, then they will become uh, iron deficient. And similarly, adolescents, because of growth spurt, they also need more iron compared to uh, the, the younger children. And ag again, unsupplemented, they might develop iron deficiency. Another important cause is blood loss because of maybe inflammatory bowel disease or dysentery, polyps, hemangioma, mycus, cow's milk protein intolerance, ankylostomiasis, the other systemic diseases like portal hypertension and bleeding and clotting disorders where, say, repeated hemarthrosis, if that is occurring, that would lead to the, the iron deficiency anemia. Now, just to uh, point out here, ankylostomiasis, despite um, so much of uh, development in our country, the, the worm infestations is still continue to be uh, the cause of uh, uh, iron deficiency in our country. Poor absorption is another cause of iron deficiency because of, say, recurrent diarrhea, celiac disease, particularly in this part of the country, parasitic infestations, and inherited disorders. Maybe the younger generation would uh, people would be interested in knowing more about this condition, iron refractory, iron deficiency anemia, which is because of a genetic defect. We'll discuss that in the later part of the presentation. So these are the causes of iron deficiency. And uh, looking at how we clinically assess the patients, the history, uh, actually mostly this anemia is noticed by the doctors. Parents do not notice this failure. They, they come with some other associated problem like maybe there is some pneumonia or diarrhea or something or they have come for some routine immunization at about nine months or maybe one and a half years and you notice that the child is pale and it, he requires a look into what is the cause of anemia. So this is a gradual onset anemia. If at all the pallor has been noticed by the parents, it would be gradual. There is an anorexia and irritability associated and if the anemia has gone on to become Severe, there could be cardiorespiratory symptoms like dyspnea and the, uh, fast breathing. Uh, history would reveal that infants and young children, they are not receiving adequate complementary feeding. And therefore, because of uh, mostly milk feed, they become iron deficient. As I highlighted in the causes, preterm low birth weight who are not supplemented with iron. And then there are some symptoms which are quite specific to iron deficiency anemia, like breath holding spells, pica, febrile seizures, and then adolescents with increased requirement. These are the things which one can elicit in the history that, and looking at these things, maybe I will spend some time on about these, uh, these clinical features of breath holding spells, pica, and febrile seizures. So uh, now it's almost, uh, you can see that the, the, the publications since 90s, they are reporting that breath-holding spells are associated with iron deficiency. In this particular uh, study, 68% of patients were found to have iron deficiency anemia. And 
when you treated these patients with or without iron, the differences were uh, quite significant. You can see that treatment with iron resulted in improvement in 84% compared to just about 21% in, uh, in patients who were not given iron treatment for breath holding spells. Uh, another uh, studies on uh, breath holding spells resulting from iron deficiency anemia. And this is a uh, more recent 2013 uh, Cochrane uh, review on breath holding. The, the two trials here, 87 children, they showed a uh, odds ratio of 76.48 and a meta-analysis that solely examined iron supplementation causing complete resolution of breath holding attacks maintained this significance with an OR of 53.43. So, and p-value was very highly significant. So, uh, there is no doubt that breath holding spells are Again, another uh, uh, this thing, 2018 uh, meta-analysis, which showed not only iron deficiency anemia, but also iron deficiency without anemia is associated with the risk of high-frequency synoptic breath-holding spells, and iron therapy results in reduction in spells frequency, which was correlated with increasing ferritin and iron levels. So this is one clinical uh, feature with which the children might be brought, and it is our duty to look for iron deficiency in all such cases. Another important clinical feature with, which might be present in uh, patients with iron deficiency is pica. Uh, belief used to be that since the child is eating some mud and clay kind of things, this might be interfering with iron absorption. But in literature, even in 60s and 50s showed that as a part of pica, some children consume ice and starchy food and this no way displaces iron-containing food in the diet or it does not interfere with iron absorption. So they postulated that pica is probably not cause of iron deficiency. It is actually resulting from iron deficiency. And this is uh, related to several uh, mechanisms like decreased activity of cytochrome oxidase in buccal mucosa, etc. They have been reported in literature. So, and this is uh, just about a month back, this uh, scoping review appeared, which showed that regardless of other clinical presentations, the uh, identification of PICA symptoms allowed treatment for iron deficiency and led to the resolution of all symptoms in all 20 articles which they were looking between the association between PICA and iron deficiency. So, therefore, it is imperative to map the available evidence to inform clinicians and allow for better patient care. So this, these were just to highlight the important uh, features like uh, pica and breath holding spell. Similarly, febrile seizures. There are studies which document that children with febrile seizures, they are more likely to have iron deficiency compared to others who come with fever and they do not have febrile seizures. So you can see the figures here, 30, 63% in uh, cases with febrile seizure and iron deficiency was lower in controls to the tune of just about uh, 24%. Another uh, meta-analysis here on systemic review and meta-analysis on association between ID and febrile seizure between 3 to 60 months of age and this showed an odds ratio of 1.52. So, concluding that ID was associated with a moderate increased risk of febrile seizures in children particularly in the areas with low and moderate prevalence of anemia. So, uh, another uh, important clinical feature which is not realized that it could be occurring because of iron deficiency is thrombosis. And I have just listed some articles where the arteri arterial ischemic strokes, central retinal vein occlusion, venous sinus thrombosis, and uh, Bercheri syndrome, they all have been reported to occur exclusively with iron deficiency. So this, uh, uh, again, uh, this uh, study of 2007 showed that children with stroke were 10 times more likely to have iron deficiency, as the figure showed 53% in cases with uh, strokes and compared to 9% in controls. So, and then it was recommended that uh, the all children with stroke should be uh, should be evaluated for iron deficiency. So actually, uh, um, in uh, this part of my talk, I'm just trying to highlight what are the important clinical features which are not realized that they might be occurring as a 
result of iron deficiency. Another important aspect is iron deficiency and cognitive dysfunction. Now, I'm not trying to say that in our busy clinical day-to-day -day practice, you look at the cognitive functions of the child, but this information is important to highlight when you are counseling the families regarding the, the continuation of treatment of, or completion of the treatment. Now, you can see that under two years of age, possible irreversibility of developmental scores even with iron therapy. That is something very disturbing. So, which means that we have to prevent the iron deficiency so that the cognitive dysfunction does not occur. In older children also, even in adolescent, even in adults, iron deficiency results in cognitive dysfunction, decrease attention span. So, but in older children and adults, this is reversible. In younger children under two years of age, which is the, the growing brain, and the, these scores might not completely reverse. And it has been shown that at five years and 10 years, these scores are lower as if the children had anemia, iron deficiency at a young age. Similarly, there are effects on development as well as socio-emotional behavior of the children. And looking at the physical examination, actually, uh, other than paler, the other things are negative findings, no or just palpable liver and spleen, no bleeds, no lymphadenopathy. There might be cholelonychia, which is typically described in literature, but I don't think I have seen cholelonychia in, say, about last 20-25 uh, uh, years. Clubbing, of course, we see in patients who have iron deficiency and this points towards the malabsorption with celiac disease being the cause of. In fact, this has also become quite uncommon because the celiac cases are being picked up uh, quite early compared to what it used to be in, uh, say, about 10-15 years back. So, to summarize this part of my talk, I would say that all children coming to your day-to-day -day practice or they are hospitalized, they should be assessed for anemia. You order CBC for whatever reason, confirm that you have looked at the CBC from the point of view of hemoglobin and the patient is anemic or not. Evaluate all cases with anemia for etiology and specifically consider iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia in patients with death holding spells, pica, febrile seizures and thrombotic events. So with this uh, background, we will move on to how we diagnose and how do we treat iron deficiency anemia. And most of this is based on these recommendations, which were published in uh, October uh, 2022. And this was a joint effort of uh, the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Chapter of IAP and Pediatric and Adolescent Nutrition Society of Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And I would request all the listeners to download this paper if they do, have, do not have seen uh, uh, this uh, as yet, though this was uh, circulated uh, in this group. So most of the guidelines that I would be discussing regarding treatment would be based on this. Now, uh, these cutoffs, you are familiar and they have been discussed in all the previous talks, the cutoff for defining uh, hemoglobin threshold. And uh, uh, the group recommends using the existing hemoglobin cut off by WHO until more reliable population-based age and gender-specific hemoglobin normogram become available. This was actually because some literature appeared in Indian uh, in uh, international publication regarding the cutoff for defining anemia should be lower in our country and also in other developing countries. But the national programs are still persisting with WHO cutoff, and I think we do not have a reason to uh, consider lower cutoff for defining anemia as yet. So we should persist. We, these are the recommendations from the, the group which is published these guidelines. Now, these are the cutoffs for defining microcytosis, macrocytosis, the cutoffs for defining iron deficiency with serum ferritin. Uh, you can see that microcytosis under two years of age, a cutoff of 70, less than 70 femtoliters. In two to 10 years, you can use a formula that is 70 plus age in years, it should be less than that. And more than 10 years, the, the cutoff of 80, which is the usual cutoff for adults that is used. Similarly, for macrocytosis, though this is uh, here, but uh, maybe in, in next uh, uh, week, uh, Dr. Pooja would uh, discuss this in details. So we take serum ferritin being low and suggestive of iron deficiency 
under 12 nanogram 12 nanogram per ml or 12 microgram per liter that is under five years and over five years this cutoff is 15 and if the patient is having infection then a cutoff of 30 is used for defining iron deficiency anemia uh, other than that you will see that we have not given serum iron levels here to define iron deficiency anemia that might appear surprising but we will discuss it further on why it is not here the other parameter is serum transferring saturation, a cutoff less than 16% defines, and uh, the others are reticulocyte hemoglobin content and hypochromic red cells. We will discuss these as we proceed further. So, uh, the recommendations on diagnosis say that in most clinical situations, a presumptive diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia can be made based on red cell indices and blood pictures suggestive of microcytic hypochromic anemia. But remember that in all such cases, a response to iron therapy should be documented for confirmation of diagnosis. So don't feel that, oh, we are sitting in such a remote area, we can't get ferritin and iron studies done. No, these, but these, these indices are sufficient to give you a diagnosis of IDA. Just see that the child is responding to uh, iron therapy. The serum ferritin has to be the first investigation if the investigative workup is required. Wherever ferritin levels are equivocal, transfer and saturation is used. And then CHR and red HE, these are the reticulocyte hemoglobin uh, uh, indices. And percentage of hypochromic cells wherever available can be used to diagnose iron deficiency. So, uh, what are those in most clinical situations? That is the infant who is at risk or children that is preterm low birth weight and they are not supplemented adolescents dietary history shows poor transition to complementary feeding more milk being consumed and clinical features suggesting iron deficiency that is breath holding spells spica and febrile seizures then you have a ps which shows microcytic hypochromic anemia and a triad of low mcv low mch and low mchc for age is consistent with the diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. Regarding ferritin being used as the first cutoff, first uh, investigation if you ever need. Now, this is actually all uh, guidelines on iron deficiency anemia across the world. All 22 guidelines in a systemic review use this uh, investigation as the first choice investigation. WHO also recommends this. And recommended cutoff of the ferritin are variable, but the WHO cutoffs are 12 and 15, which uh, have been recommended by Indian Academy of Pediatrics also. So, uh, in the infant, in the presence of inflammation or infection, a cutoff of uh, 30 could be used. Why iron studies are not recommended uh, uh, as a, a test for diagnosing iron deficiency anemia is. There is a day-to-day -day variability in iron levels and they are influenced by recent intake. And so iron estimation is done, but this is done to calculate the, the transferring saturation or TIBC, total iron binding capacity. So uh, these studies are recommended only when ferritin levels are equivocal and threshold for transferring saturation, we have seen that this is under less than 16%. So, uh, whenever you order iron studies, please remember there would be some labs would, which would be doing ferritin within those iron studies. Otherwise, you might have to write iron studies including serum ferritin. Or you just ask for serum ferritin when you are ordering for investigation in a case of suspected iron deficiency. What about reticulocyte hemoglobin? This is because the lifespan of retics is very short. The measurement of reticulocyte HV helps determine the availability of iron to form hemoglobin. And this is actually gaining pro uh, popularity because at times you have conditions where the ferritin would be uh, haywire, like uh, in chronic renal uh, uh, disease, where ferritin could be uh, abnormal because of some infection or inflammation going on. So the retic uh, uh, hemoglobin, that gives a correct measure of uh, status of the iron in the body. And the low values reliably indicate iron deficient erythropoiesis. And they also serve as the earliest indicator of iron deficiency anemia if you are monitoring on, on the retic hemoglobin. So uh, they can be used for assessing the response as well. These are two, uh, you can see two, uh, two printout of the reports. 
you can see the lowest parameter is retic hemoglobin and these cases are being evaluated for macrocytic anemia with an mcv of 104 and the other case is 103.3 and you can see in one the, re the retic hb is uh, 25.4 which is low the cutoff for this is uh, uh, 29.3 so here the iron deficiency is not there the red hb is uh, 29.3 and the the previous the, on the on the left side this is 25 so this patient also has uh, uh, uh iron deficiency in relation in addition to the macrocytic anemia that he is having Hypochromic RBCs are not very commonly available. Uh, this slide, which on the previous slide I showed the printout, this is from the, uh, the report from Lady Harding, and I'm sure several other large hospitals might be having the seven-part analyzer, which gives you the retic HB also. So percentage hypochromic cells, that is more than 5% of the RBCs, if they are hypochromic, which is uh, uh, suggestive of, highly suggestive of RNA anemia. This is just a, a ROC curve of several indices used for defining RN deficiency. So now moving on to the treatment. As I said, uh, almost everything is based on those guidelines and these uh, guidelines will tell you the dose, the duration, the number of doses, the type of drug, what all to use. But looking at what are the what is the aim of treatment is to provide iron therapy in the appropriate dose formulation and duration to restore hemoglobin to normal and replete the body iron stores so the therapy has to continue till you have replenished the body iron stores the comprehensive treatment should include identification of any secondary cause of iron deficiency and its management treat treatment should address the dietary modification and also address the associated conditions like breath holding spells and thrombocytosis. The follow-up is required for assessment of therapeutic response. And in addition, assess the siblings because he is also growing in the same milieu. And the mother, particularly if the, 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 the case is a young child, looking at the mother and treating her iron deficiency also is important. And finally, attaching all cases that you have treated for RN deficiency to anemia mukt Bharat program for continued preventive supplementation by Anganwadi worker or ANMs as the case may be. So just do not uh, uh, do not stop at prescribing iron uh, syrup. There are several other things that you need to do. These are the several iron salts which are there in the market, whereas sulfate, fumarate, and uh, mino filators, polymartos complex, but the the recommendation, uh, okay, for the SARS recommendation is on the next slide. So oral route is safe, effective, and economical, and leads to rapid improvement in HB if administered in correct dose and followed up appropriately. And it is convenient for the parents and is well tolerated by almost all patients. Why it is important here to highlight is that the, the uh, adult literature on RN deficiency anemia talks of giving intravenous therapy in one go, particularly in Western countries. In India also, there are people who are recommending for adult iron deficiency anemia, just giving, uh, because that the, the intravenous iron uh, therapy has become really very safe and uh, this can be very safely given. But in children, still we are persisting with oral uh, iron therapy, which is quite safe and effective and economical. So these are the salts which are recommended, sulfate, fumarate, and gluconate. And actually, sulfate is not available in the, the, the syrup form. So most of your syrups would be containing ferrous fumarate or uh, ferrous gluconate. And please remember what is the content of uh, uh, the, the, the iron content in particular preparation that you are writing. Most of the preparations do contain about 30 or 33 milligram elemental iron in 5 ml. But then there are several others which have come up with 80 in 5 ml and some 250 in 5 ml if you have not uh, prescribed correctly, so the, the syrup with higher concentration could be given. And use of prolonged release or entry coated iron tablets is or liposomal iron formulation is not recommended by our group. The reason being the entry coated tablet, the iron gets the, uh, uh, the, the coating gets dissolved in the lower part of intestine. The, we all know that iron gets absorbed in the upper part of intestine. 
So there is no point using these tablets unless there are some adverse effects. So uh, dose of two to three milligram for two to three up to two to three months after hemoglobin normalizes, single dose daily dose is recommended. And while on treatment, the patient seven days and fourteen days, depending upon what is the severity of anemia, will see the details about these in the next few slides. So uh, dose of two to three versus five to six milligram. Unfortunately, several textbooks still maintain five to six milligram per kg, but the very recent article, 2017, Powers et al., they demonstrated an excellent response in iron deficiency anemia. I am not quoting the figures here, just with 3 mg per kg dose. And if you look at the adult recommendations, this is why uh, in GUT by British Society of Gastroenterology, uh, they, they are prescribing iron tablet in adults, uh, one to two tablets to start with. And this tablet in UK also contains 66 milligram elemental iron, that is one tablet. So they are not going beyond two milligrams. So why a child should be given higher dose? So that is as far as the milligram per kg dose is concerned. Second issue is that whether to give a single or divided dose. Now, uh, single dose administration ensures a long-term compliance. And administration in the evening after dinner improves gastrointestinal tolerance. This is again by British Society of Gastroenterology. And single dose leads to better reticulocytosis uh, uh, response that has been documented in literature. And more recently, this group, Moretti et al., they are publishing literature on the fraction of iron absorbed from the second dose of the day is much less because of the hepcidin response. Now, what they did in the study is that use a, they used uh, uh, different uh, isotope uh, of iron, like say iron 59 and iron 61. So in the morning, they gave iron 59 and in the evening, they gave iron 61. And they could demonstrate that iron 61 absorption from the second dose was much lower compared to what was iron 59 absorption. They repeated the, uh, in some patient, they did the other way around 61 was given in the morning and 59 in the evening. Again, the, the second dose absorption was much lower and that was explained because of the hepcidin because immediately as you give uh, uh, the oral dose, the hepcidin increases and that leads to decreased absorption of uh, iron from the second dose. Now duration, that is iron therapy to be continued for two to three months after hemoglobin normalizes and I have repeated it on several uh, times in these slides. So uh, remembering that one dose Two milligram per kg continued for three months after normalization of hemoglobin. So uh, maybe you can remember a uh, formula of one, two, three. And the dietary advice should include we reduce the milk. If there is bottle, then stop bottle, and that it part, uh, partially leads to decreased milk consumption by the child. Age appropriate complementary feeding for the young child, including food diversity and iron food, iron rich food consumption. That is what one use needs to advise for the diet in these cases. Follow-up is recommended seven, after seven days uh, in patients with uh, severe anemia and in mild to moderate anemia at 14 days. This again, we have put it as seven days because a child say who is being, who is being sent home at say five gram hemoglobin, we would not like that he should come after 14 days. He should be seen after seven days, though the hemoglobin might not have increased, but we would know that the patient is having improvement uh, and he is tolerating the iron therapy. There are no adverse effects and the, the, the drug is being consumed. So follow-up visits are used for compliance, tolerating the therapy and clinical improvement. And again, you can emphasize the dietary diversity in at this visit. So how do we assess the responses? The initial response is improvement in appetite and general well-being, which occurs as early as 24 to 48 hours. There is reduction in pica and breath-holding space, particularly if the breath-holding space are, say, several times in a week. Uh, and pica, of course, these, these will uh, reduce uh, substantially in just about a, a week or 10 days' time follow-up, one can see. And uh, uh, the peak retic occurs between 5 to 10 uh, days following iron therapy. But don't expect that hemoglobin rise will start at this time. So this might take 7 to 10 days before any hematocrit rises. And similarly, after that also, the, the, the rise is a little slower. 
So hemoglobin does not increase very rapidly. In a week's time, there would be hardly any change. If you can afford to get a reticulocyte count, then that would be the best thing. I think. सर डिस्कनेक्ट हो गए क्या हाँ वही मैं उनको ढूंढ रहा हूँ कि पैनलिस्ट में ज्वाइन तो नहीं हुई हाँ वो उसी लिंक से आएंगे लेकिन वो ऑटोमेटिकली आ जाता है एक बार दे दो ट्राई कर ये ना वायर्ड कनेक्शन का मैसेज हर मीटिंग से एक दिन पहले फैकल्टी ग्रुप में डालो हम्म कॉल कर रहे हो आप नहीं कॉल नहीं किया मैं वो ढूंढ ही रहा था आप कॉल कर लो मैं इतने इधर देखता हूँ ज्वाइन There is a power disruption at his place, so वो सब कुछ तो he is coming via phone internet. सर मोबाइल से ज्वाइन कर पाएंगे क्या कर रहे हैं सर कर रहे हैं मे बी हम प्रेजेंटेशन भी पहले मंगा लेंगे और Welcome back, sir. Yeah, sorry. Uh, there is no uh, power here right now. So we were discussing about the treatment part, and uh, I would read up my slides uh, from here. They, 
I think we are already uh, almost 75% done. So regarding the transmissions, we use those. Uh, am I audible now? Hanji, sir, bilkul. Achha, okay. So the cutoffs are 4 gram uh, hemoglobin per deciliter. That is uh, uh, for transfusion and between 4 to 6 if there are associated signs of cardiac decompensation. Uh, what about uh, when the oral iron therapy uh, patient do not respond to oral iron therapy? That is uh, how do we evaluate uh, these patients? And actually, uh, what do we see in uh, literature is that they start with you evaluate for these uh, causes and it is not mentioned how to define that these are, these are the patients who should be investigated for uh, uh, non-response. So here the definitions has been given that is if a child with uh, severe anemia does not show a rise of hemoglobin of one gram in two weeks time or a mild to moderate anemia if is not showing a rise of hemoglobin in uh, uh, four weeks' time, he should be labeled as not responding to uh, the, the iron therapy and needs to be investigated. And uh, what investigations need to be done, they include how do we evaluate is to uh, ensure that compliance to adequate dose is there and uh, we need to review the history of the patient for any intercurrent illness or infections. And uh, uh, correct dose was prescribed. It was taken in correct uh, doses and uh, uh, there is no infection. And then evaluate uh, the conditions uh, which are hindering for RNA absorption like celiac disease or recurrent diarrhea. Uh, look for associated B12 or folate deficiency. Here a review of PS would be required for dimorphic anemia. And then finally, looking for occurred blood loss, which would uh, exclude the causes of cow's milk protein intolerance, meckles, and inflammatory bowel disease. And look for other causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia, finally, that is beta thalassemia trait and uh, the RN refractory RN deficiency anemia. So I think I'll join. The, the uh, power has got restored. I will join and present from there now. Just give me a minute.
think I don't see those icons now. The 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 uh, sharing slide. So must be there now. No. The green icon should be there in the middle. Yeah, now it is there. So we were talking about uh, uh, evaluation of non-responders, and I think we discussed this part. So uh, I think this uh, again is differentiating the RN frequency for beta helisma trait. This was discussed in last talks as well. But uh, just uh, to highlight, the both conditions are microcytic hypochromic anemia with low MCV, MCH, and MCHC. And the RDW is different. In IDA, it would be more, uh, and in beta helisma trait, it would be less. TRVC count would be less proportionately depending upon the severity of anemia. And uh, uh, it would be more than 5 million. These are the cutoffs for beta thalassemia trait. And Metzer index, which is MCV divided by total RBC count, this would be less than 13 in beta thal trait and more than 13 in iron deficiency anemia. So uh, then you need to differentiate iron deficiency from anemia of chronic disease. And here, uh, maybe a chronic disease and iron deficiency is associated. But uh, you can see the column two and three, they differentiate between iron deficiency anemia as well as anemia of chronic disease. So serum iron would be low in both, but saturation would be decreased in IDA and normal in uh, uh, ACD. Ferritin would be lower in iron deficiency anemia and it would be more in uh, anemia of chronic disease. MCV is generally uh, normal in uh, anemia of chronic disease, but it may be low if it is chronically persisting. So, and then, then we uh, go on to some other tests like circulating transferrin receptors, which are increased in RN deficiency or they are, they are normal in anemia of chronic disease. And hepcidin helps us in uh, uh, defining this etiology, whether it is RN deficiency or ACD. So, hepcidin is low in RN deficiency anemia and in anemia of chronic disease, this is increased. So uh, this is something uh, which I mentioned, uh, the IR, IRIDA, that is iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. And this is something, uh, a very new uh, recent uh, topic in, uh, in microcytic hypochromic anemias. Actually, this is uh, anemia which is related to uh, genetic uh, defect. And uh, just to uh, see this, iron homeostasis is maintained by a peptide hormone called hepcidin, which is secreted from the liver, and that is why the term uh, hepcidin. So it regulates the intestinal iron adsorption. It also regulates the macrophage-mediated iron recycling from this uh, the old RVCs, and also it uh, regulates the iron mobilization from these stores. And uh, in the intestines, what hepcidin does is that it inhibits iron adsorption in the proximal small intestine through furoportin iron exporter. And uh, uh, due to mutation in transmembrane protease serine 6, TMPRSS6 gene, the, the, uh, the hepcidin levels are this, uh, not in line with what usually they are in iron deficiency. So in contrast to low or undetectable hepcidin levels observed in acquired iron deficiency, in patient with IRIDA, serum hepcidin is inappropriately high for the low iron status. And this accounts for poor dietary iron adsorption and absent or delayed response to 
oral iron treatment. So uh, these cases uh, are reported in pediatric age group. The degree of anemia is variable, uh, but there is no direct correlation between the age of onset and degree of anemia. Though they are anemic and iron deficient, the, the patient do not have growth or development or intellectual retardation. They are normal. Anemia is like iron deficiency. It is characterized by hypochromic microcytic RBCs. Very low serum iron levels and transference saturation levels are seen, but ferritins are mostly within the normal range and hepcidin levels are high. So, uh, and the diagnosis comes from the, the uh, genetic uh, mutation testing. And treatment is, of course, with parental iron. A response to parental iron is variable, but generally leads to progressive increase in hemoglobin. Correction of anemia is not complete. It is partial and slower. And uh, HP levels rarely normalize. Even though the HP levels might increase, the microcytosis will persist. Transparent saturation levels also remain low, below normal levels. But ferritin increases in a dose-dependent dose manner. So uh, these all our features are explained on the basis of hepcidin ferroportin interaction. And uh, yeah. it's not something very common, though uh, we have started diagnosing this condition in India, but in large series of those patients who have not responded to uh, uh, the, the iron therapy, only uh, some 5 to 10 percent have been diagnosed as having IRT. So, uh, what about parental iron therapy used in pediatric age group? Uh, as I said, it has become a lot more uh, uh, simpler and a uh, lot more acceptable in adults. But uh, I can tell you that I don't think I have used parental iron in last 30 years in my practice. So, you can imagine uh, how infrequently this therapy is required. But all the same, just to complete the topic, the indications would include poor adherence or intolerability due to GI side effects. If there is a need for rapid replenishment of hemoglobin, particularly in preoperative situations, then you might use the parental iron. You can't wait, say, for two to three months for uh, the the iron uh, the hemoglobin improvement with oral iron therapy. Ongoing blood loss that exceeds the capacity of oral iron to meet the needs, like in heavy uterine bleeding or mucosal telangiectasia. Iron malabsorption due to pre-existing defects like short bowel syndrome, coexisting inflammatory state that interferes with iron hemostasis, and chronic kidney disease and genetic form that is IRID. So uh, this is one uh, review of indications of IV therapy in this series of 145 patients uh, between three months to 18 years. You can see that nearly three fourths of them. 73.8% were because of the kidney diseases. And of the remaining 38 cases, 13 were unresponsive due to poor compliance or adverse effect. 13 were having malabsorption states. 7 because of ongoing blood losses. And only 2 had IRIDA. So this is from some center in USA. You can see that even uh, those who are requiring IV therapy, the IRIDA makes a very small uh, proportion of such cases. So these are the preparations which are approved for use. In India, there is no separate approval for pediatric age group, but iron sucrose and uh, this uh, ferric carboxymaltose and ferric derisomaltose, these are approved in India, though in uh, uh, the US FDA has approved low molecular weight dextran as well as ferric glucoronate as well. So how do we calculate the dose? Uh, for IV iron, that is, dose of iron for undernourished children should be calculated with the present weight, while for obese patient, ideal or lean body weight should be used for calculating the, the, the uh, total IV iron dose. And we use the formula of the HV iron deficit that is, uh, uh, is equal to body weight in kgs into ideal hemoglobin minus desired hemoglobin into 2.145 plus iron to replenish the stores if you desire that. So this is how you calculate and this is an example one can see how it is. Uh, uh, the, the iron sucrose administration does not require a pre-medication except in patients who have comorbidity of bronchial asthma or there's a history of drug allergy or inflammatory arthritis. These patients require uh, 
the pill medication with intravenous uh, methylprednisolone. So lastly, coming to the prevention of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia, and I think as pediatricians, we should take upon ourselves to be one this group recommendation that uh, I showed in Indian pediatrics. We have very categorically said that all children should be screened at 9 to 12 months for uh, presence of anemia. Uh, that is when the child is coming to you for the uh, MR or Mises or MMR vaccination at 9 months. This is the time you should do a hemoglobin in all cases. And uh, in low birth weight and preterm babies, this is, uh, 2 to 4 milligram per kg of elemental iron is recommended from 2 to 4 weeks of life till 12 months of age. And then thereafter, the patient should be attached to the anemia Mukbarak program. And in view of operational feasibility, intermittent iron folate supplementation is being recommended in anemia Mukbarak. And of course, uh, this is uh, not in our hands. The, at the time of delivery at the public health level, this intervention does help. Delayed cord clamping is recommended. Uh, infant should be exclusively breastfed for six months. Ensure proper complementary feeding after six months of age and early uh, in early infancy, two to four milligram per kg to low birth weight. We have said that and ensure checking the siblings for anemia. These are the steps that one can take to prevent iron deficiency anemia. So to conclude uh, my talk, I would reiterate that ensure that all patients you have seen are assessed for anemia clinically. Ensure that in all CBC reports, you have checked the hemoglobin is correct or not. Assess all anemic children for the cause, clinically as well as on CBC and PS. IDA can be diagnosed on the basis of low MCB, MCH and MCHC. Treat iron deficiency anemia with single dose of oral iron therapy with a 2 to 3 milligram per kg dose. Emphasize on need for therapy and complete duration of therapy. Assess the response to iron replacement therapy. Attached to anemia mukbarak program for prophylactic iron after complete, completing the treatment, treat the underlying conditions, underlying cause, if it has been identified. Document response, investigate for cause of non-response, look at the siblings for the presence of anemia. Proactive approach, that is looking for anemia at nine months. During first and second immunization visit, check if the child was high risk and it needed iron uh, supplementation and was it started or not. Emphasize exclusive breastfeeding and counsel and review or complementary feeding at the time of nine months vaccination visit. So I think that's the last slide. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the interruption because of the power disruption on my end. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful presentation. The house is open for questions. Uh, there's one question, sir. What is BHS? Sir, please stop sharing the screen from that uh, yeah. green button on the top. Yeah, sure. There'll be, uh, along with the green line, there'll be a red button on the top, sir. Can you do that from your end? Sir, it's done. It's done. Okay, all right. Done. So BHS is breath holding spell, the abbreviation for, for breath holding uh -huh. spell. Nothing uh, rocket science there. Uh -huh. So uh, there's one uh, that uh, RN effect, uh, why RN effect is irreversible uh, in cognitive development in a child less than two years of age? Uh, I don't know if I would have answer to that, but, uh, but I think the brain connections are already made uh, by two years of age. So whatever happens, yeah, so that two... might be the disruption out there. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Maybe this is the developing brain where if the insult occurs, the uh, the further development will not occur. And in a child, say two years or older, already the 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 uh, these pathways have developed, and the effect, if at all, would be there and. Uh, that would be, uh, say, temporary and uh, it would be treatable. I think this is something like cretinism in RN deficiency also. It happens. And what is the best time of the day to give iron supplement? Dr. Rahul has asked. Uh, uh, I think uh, one has to see that what is the most convenient time for the parents to give. So, uh, though the, the gastroenterology chapters, they write 
the dose to be given at bed time and there is a reason for that the one reason is that in the night the gut transit time is slow so the the time uh, available for the iron absorption is much more compared to if you would give it in daytime so for the same reason the iron response is better but that is we should resort to that in patients who have adverse effect so in the daytime any time away from the milk particularly one and a half hours uh, before and after the iron dose milk should not be given and uh, currently what is happening is that lot of our patients those who need iron therapy they also need say calcium uh, uh, therapy because of associated rickets so there again one has to see it should be away from calcium so best is to give calcium in the morning and evening and iron in the sometime in the uh, middle of the day maybe after lunch or something the iron be given with it's vitamin okay, c individualized huh? yes should iron be given with vitamin c iron um, vitamin c is known to uh, uh, improve the iron absorption but there is no uh, recommendation for routinely adding vitamin c and even the ascorbate uh, which is uh, you know uh, the the companies people tell that this is a better drug to uh, <laughs> for the iron therapy iron uh, deficiency just, anemia but there is no much uh, better response in and just a marketing very, gimmick there is that is a very costly uh, drug compared to what we the fumarate and gluconate are so one and has to uh, really see the cost because the family has to give iron for say about 4 to 6 months so it's not something uh, like if you are uh, giving one bottle in two weeks so, so Uh, the, the, there is difference between uh, the, the gluconate and uh, uh, the fumarate syrups and ascorbate syrups. And when shall we do iron profile after blood transfusion in case it is needed to be done? Why one would like to do a uh, say you mean if the blood transfusion has been given and still a iron studies are required that way? So here, I think uh, the ferritin will not get altered. Transfusion is done just for the anemia part. I I believe, uh, Doctor Sanket, uh, would you like to ask ask question? Like, please raise your hand. Hello. Ah, uh, please ask yeah. your question. Ah, uh, good af good morning, sir. Ah, uh, yes, sir, in case ah. Uh, A child of uh, four, five months has come with iron, severe iron deficiency anemia, and uh, we have transfused it, uh, and we need to do the iron profile. We don't have a pre-BT sample, so when can we do the iron profile after transfusion? See, if you have to look at the ferritin, I think uh, uh, it will not get altered uh, with one blood transfusion. So ferritin can be done. Say when the patient is stable, you can do a ferritin. Serum iron, of course. Uh, Uh, i mean it's not really required as well and um, uh, one can do ferritin to see whether the iron deficiency is there or not but the 5 month old is very uh, unlikely age to have a severe iron deficiency anyway though it does occur but then it's very rare under 6 months of age okay thank you so much sir yeah. sir next is uh, what's your comments on the colloidal iron I think it's same. Colloidal iron is uh, uh, a drug which is available and it does have uh, um, uh, effect, good effect. But uh, again, the cost is more compared to the, the usual preparations of fumarate and gluconate. But it there is nothing against that drug, other than cost. Yes. So then, Doctor Inderji, uh, Inder Manjit saying that uh, milk intake needs to be decreased due to interaction of uh, calcium with iron. Or over intake of milk leading to decreased intake of diet. I think just a comment, and doctor, uh, do we need to add prophylactic iron drops to newborns in first six months of exclusive breastfeeding? In a normal, normal uh, weight, normal full term infant does not need iron supplementation under six months of age. This is only preterm and uh, low birth weight babies. They need after six months. They uh, it is recommended. There is a phys physiological nadir also of the hemoglobin occurring at this. In this yeah, year. that is fine. That is two and a half to three months, uh, depending upon uh, how uh, what was the weight of the child. But then that is the time when iron uh, supplementation is not required. 
So why liposomal iron should not be used? Why? Liposomal iron should not be used. Why liposomal iron? The cost factor is the, uh, this thing. And uh, uh, it is not uh, uh, better effective compared to what the, these the common salts are. When HPLC should be done in severe anemia? When? HPLC should be done in severe anemia. When should it? HPLC is not an investigation for severe anemia. It is only when you are suspecting some hemoglobinopathy. See, what HPLC is telling you is uh, uh, the uh, hemoglobinopathy, the abnormal hemoglobins, like in uh, thalassemia syndromes or sickle, or if you have E, beta, etc. in your uh, uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, a child, say, in whom you are suspecting RN deficiency and beta thalassemia trait is a uh, differential, that will not be a severe anemia. So, uh, in severe anemia, unless you have a hepatosomegaly where you think that hemoglobinopathy is the uh, the differential diagnosis, then you need the uh, HPLC for diagnosis. How much effective is the ferric diphosphate salt for iron deficiency anemia? Is it better than the sulfate or ascorbate? Uh, see, actually, head-to-head -head trials are not there. But there is no added advantage of that salt. And, and uh, uh, theoretically, the ferric salts are not uh, uh, better than ferrous salts. Okay, sir. Now, some kids don't accept iron syrups, whatever we do. Uh, have you noticed any best formulation which is better tolerated or in such cases, how to go about it? I think you people will be answer, able to answer <laughs> better than what I would. Because uh, there are, uh, like, uh, people have, uh, you know, used the sprinklers, uh, which are the iron preparations, which can be sprinkled over the complementary food, and uh, that can be consumed. But uh, uh, one can give a smaller dose of uh, iron to start with and then gradually build up the dose. That would be one way of giving. Say, toneferon drops, I don't think there is much uh, problem in accept acceptance of that. So, particularly. The only thing is the syrup toneferon is very high in iron content. One has to be very, very careful. Yeah, that's why I said the syrup uh, toneferon, they, they have come up with a 80 milligram uh, syrup also. But then one has to write specifically 80 milligram per 5 ml or 250 milligram per 5 ml. One has to be careful. And in my discussion also, I said that you should be familiar with what preparation you are writing and how much is the elemental iron content. Best is, I think, if we give, give the drops, the amount is less. And yeah. uh, child can easily accept 1 ml in two divided doses also. It can be given. Yeah. So... Uh, not uh, something uh, very commonly encountered, but uh, sprinklers, I don't know whether they are commercially easily available, but that is another option. Uh, there is one Tessiron is available, which is orange flavored. Uh, it's a sachet with granules that can be used. Yeah, yeah. Uh, does a child uh, with uh, pulmonary hemosidrosis require frequent blood transfusions? Um, Pulmonary hemosiderosis actually requires a lot of uh, uh, the respiratory system management. And in the acute uh, phase, uh, the treatment is uh, the corticosteroid and bronchodilators. If the anemia has been uh, allowed to persist, then transfusion would be required. But uh, if the cases are picked up early when the bleeding occurs and it has been, uh, the intervention has been done early, then the, the uh, transfusions are not very commonly required. Next question is role of injectable iron preparations. I think that we have discussed in the uh, presentation. Should we give iron prophylactically in children? Dr. Pradeep Shukla has asked. Yeah, I think uh, the national programs requirements from six months onward prophylactic iron is recommended and the NNF recommendation and now the IAP recommendation in our document is also to give that to uh, preterm and uh, low birth weight infants starting at two to four weeks of age. So that is prophylactic iron actually. Dr. Kesolu, would you like to ask something? Please unmute. Dr. Kesavalu? Anyway, what are the stepwise uh, changes in iron deficiency anemia like NCH, MCHE, NCV? 
what what goes down first and then we yeah <laughs> so actually i because of uh, it would have increased the uh, the duration so i didn't go into that uh, see basically uh, initial would be the, the fall in the stores and after that uh, there would be microcytosis develops first and then the uh, the mch starts to do so the mcv goes down first and then the rest of the things yeah so uh, the the uh, the stores would go down first that means if you are looking at iron deficiency even in the absence of anemia you can uh, uh, pick up uh, uh, this uh, by doing serum ferritin and uh, early diagnosis can be made by the hypochromic percentage of hypochromic cells uh, that if that test is available so hypochromia comes first that is mch and mcv also decreases so uh, the hemoglobin comes down later and after dinner and in, in between meals, I think this already answered. Dr. Sanjay has asked. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Kesavalu, please ask. Uh, sir, sir. Sir, uh, so though it is uh, out of the way, uh, which brand uh, the available uh, iron preparation you prefer, sir? Because we are all practitioners. Uh, because hematology is a rocket science for us. Sir, sir. No, uh, I don't know if... Uh, uh, we should be, uh, you know, announcing here what preparations I use. I use mostly the gluconate and fumarate preparations. And we have already said that tonopharone is something for uh, younger children, we use that. And uh, I, I, I have written a lot of good for for syrup. And I am quite happy with the email. Uh, Dr. Sandeh has asked, the role of supplementing uh, vitamin B12 and folic acid along with iron deficiency anemia. Dose and duration of iron supplement in preterm and low birth weight. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, see, uh, if the patient is really malnourished and uh, uh, poor, they might have associated B12 and folate deficiency, and this might be a dimorphic picture which some of which might evolve on treatment with just iron. And actually, what happens is that you are giving iron when you are giving iron, you are anyway giving folic acid. In India, there is hardly any preparation which is uh, which does not contain folic acid. But as of now, the group has not recommended using routinely the uh, B12 uh, along with the, the treatment of iron deficiency. Certainly, when the, the, the response is not adequate as on expected lines, one should look at the PS, whether now it has become more, more kind of dimorphic, then one should add and look at the, the B12 for it, Lewis as a cause of non response to uh, inadequate response to iron treatment so uh, routine supplementation with b12 along with is not required and in preterm sir dose uh, remains the same preterms and low birth with babies 2 mg uh, actually 2 to 4 is written but i would prefer 2 mg per kg starting at 2 to 4 weeks right uh, dr kanchan said he has said will shakar in milk get absorbed because in Punjab, people use shakar in milk or tea because they think the shakar is made of, contains yeah. more iron. Shakar, uh, you mean the, some, some uh, derivate, derivate like derivation from good, right? Yeah, yeah yes. actually, uh, 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 the person who is talking, uh, have you seen how the good is being prepared nowadays in Punjab? <laughs> See, uh, uh, they... Dr. They, Kanchan they, City, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm there. Yeah. Sir, it is made in iron. Yeah, sir. It is made in iron utensils, actually. So, yeah, actually, I, yeah. Yeah, from there only the iron comes. They, they, yeah. they, uh, they, uh, juice does not contain much iron, right? So, if they are still using uh, iron utensils for making uh, good, then of course this would have iron more. But uh, sir, there is some yeah. literature now saying that. Lord, not all places the good is being prepared in iron utensils. So the iron content of good is not all that great currently what it used to be uh, earlier. So it no, can't sir, be therapeutic, this thing, but it might be recommended as one of the, the iron containing food, maybe. Yeah. Food sir, but, uh, sir, but calcium in the milk will interfere with the iron absorption in the shakar if you mix both. My question is that actually. Even if it is in the recommendation is to have good chana, that is, uh, it will give proteins as well as uh, some iron and calories also. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, so they, then, they, uh, they, they do interfere, but uh, you have to take uh, the uh, what is what could be the little bit advantage that you can get. I think uh, giving anything with milk will reduce the iron absorption anyway. So avoid giving iron yeah. through milk. See, from that point of view, if WHO has uh, looked at how we uh, the Indian diets are like. You have you talk of lot of palak palak being used for uh, the, the iron containing uh, food. Now, what do you do uh, well uh, for palak preparation? You make it palak paneer. Now, whatever iron is there, you are trying to reduce it, and then if you change it from there, you you make it uh, iron uh, the palak core. So you are adding certain things <laughs> to reduce the iron absorption. But then uh, the palatability is a major issue. If something is palatable, it could be consumed. Otherwise, it will not be. If you give somebody to it just palak, uh, I mean palak alu or something, the children may not like. So it is like uh, uh, palak. It's uh, maybe the iron contained in uh, spinach will not be absorbed much if you are uh, using uh, this thing paneer and uh, corn. But uh, uh, at least something better than not getting at all. Sir, one more question is there. Uh... <laughs> Sir, are you listening to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Go yes, on. sir. Sir, like uh, we uh, get CBC sometime. HB is almost normal, but MCH is low, MCSC is low. So how long we have to give iron in that case? MCH, MC, AB is low. And... Uh, uh, HB is almost in, normal. Almost normal. See, in such case, I think we should look at whether the, this is because of iron deficiency or not. No, no, sir, if it comes out to be iron deficiency only and HB is almost normal, MCH and MCSC, they are low, below normal limit, like 27 to 24, like that only, not yes. very much low. So actually, if you have, if you look at the normal iron, we are using cutoff for defining anemia. But yeah. if you look at the uh, the iron range, say in a, in a child of five years, this would be something like 11 to 13. Fine. Right. So, so maybe if you are looking at eleven point two and MCV MCHC is low, in that okay. case you give and you give and see whether the, this is improving the uh, uh, the the okay. hemoglobin or not. Okay. Okay. Got my answer, sir. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. Sir, uh, duration of iron therapy two to three months after the normalization of HB. Sir, the dose yes. will be the same for before after the normalization yes. of HB. Yes. 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 The dose is same. Therapeutic dose only. Okay. So, best iron formulation is accepted in pediatric age group. I think that's what <laughs> we have know from the experience. <laughs> and uh, so, what's are your views on uh, ferrous ascorbate preparation? Ferrous ascorbate preparation, as we discussed earlier as well, like it is effective. There is one study from in uh, published in Indian Pediatrics and uh, uh, it is equally efficacious, but then cost is effective. Dr. Niharika is almost two and a half, almost two and a half to three times more costly than the fumarate and other preparations. Okay. So then Dr. Niharika is asked for the sprinkles. I think we have discussed uh, how to differentiate between IR, IDA versus anemia of chronic disease as both have high hepcidin levels. Dr. Aditya has go, asked. Go, go for mutation. Oh, these, these days it is available. There are several several companies which are doing this med genome and there are several ways where you can get this uh, test done. And I think institutes like AIMS and PGI are also doing team PRSS 6 mutation. So please tell us about uh, complementary feeding practices to consider for preventing iron deficiency. In I think complementary feeding <laughs> should be whatever is available at home. That should be started and iron uh, should be given if... Uh, Supplementarily, iron should be started after six months. Yes, I think uh, one should look at the the feeding guidelines for uh, infant and young child feeding guidelines, IYCF guidelines. There are modules available online. And if you want to look at maybe the uh, FIMNCI or uh, WHO guidelines on uh, the management of children in smaller hospitals, this will also have uh, chapters on complementary feeding. So, uh, complementary feeding uh, for a child of, say, uh, one year, six months to one year, uh, what the IMNCI writes is at least two katori of uh, 
the food articles and the articles uh, we all know that this should not be something uh, very thin or liquid like and uh, uh, thick preparation does not require chewing and uh, it should not in a child who is breastfed it should not contain a lot of milk so it could be uh, say uh, some kind of halwa or some panjiri kind of thing and uh, maybe dal chawal khichdi a lot of vegetables in this and, and these are the complementary feeds which are recommended one should aim at giving two katoris full in say six months to uh, one year certainly certainly in one go it will not start it will gradually it will go so uh, com complementary feeding is a big chapter in itself and i have told you where all to look for the complementary feeding for children so how to calculate iron needed to replenish stores Generally, 25 to 30 percent of the total dose uh, in IV that is recommended. That one formula I gave, and uh, that is uh, uh, even in OP guy for intramuscular iron, this used to be uh, I think 25 to 30 percent above the the total requirement for correction of anemia. So how do you counsel parents for tooth straining during prophylactic iron supplementation? Yeah, uh, what I do is I tell them that always give some water to drink. Uh, after this, so uh, and tooth staining will not occur with that. And if the child is big enough, maybe a little more water. जो छः महीने के सात महीने के बच्चे को तो ज़्यादा नहीं पिला पाओगे, but a child of four five years may uh, uh, take a lot of water after taking the iron. Will brushing help after taking iron? It will, older child four five will, years. It will, but it will, but it would increase one more task for the family. Yes, no, no. Normally, if the child is getting brushed at night, also like after uh -huh. giving iron, get the brush done after the. Uh -huh. And uske baad uh, pani pila ke uske baad mein brush karwa sakte. Yeah, uh -huh. that will help. Yeah. So when on antibiotics, whether to stop iron? Uh, acute bacterial infections, yes. So if you are one is prescribing uh, antibiotics for that, certainly uh, one should stop. Dr. Pramod has. Uh, Dr. Pramod, would you like to ask a question? Please unmute. Yes, sir. Uh, in uh, I just wanted to know uh, in day-to-day -day OPD practice, uh, how much the role of prophylactic iron uh, uh, prescription, like in toddlers, when we say uh, uh, bi-weekly iron at 45 mg, shall we continue it for a prolonged time? See, uh, I think prophylactic iron. Uh, uh, that means a toddler. You have checked that. Uh, this child is uh, uh, not anemic. Yeah, not anemic. So uh, in that case, either you attach him to anemia Mukbarat uh, program interventions, and if you are prescribing yourself, then go by what anemia Mukbarat program tells. And this is nowadays recommended across the life cycle. So, yes, sir, uh, I wanted so to just under to under five years, the guideline for under five years, then for. School children and then for adolescents and finally for adults. So it's across the life cycle the iron uh, supplementation is required. right, right, sir. So Dr. Naresh has asked, iron absorption is better before food. Then why give it after dinner? <laughs> so uh, again, uh, uh, if there are adverse effects, then only it's better to give uh, after meals and uh, uh, at the dinner time. Otherwise, you can give any time, and if you want to take advantage of uh, uh, better resorption, then you give empty stomach. If somebody is not having adverse effect with, with that, one can give empty stomach. Okay, so then uh, Dr. Mamta has asked, most of the time parents themselves stop the iron therapy even without informing us, as they find child is not accepting it happily. So that so, is where the follow-up and counseling we have stressed in our uh, publication. And uh, there is no shortcut to it. You have to counsel and they have to understand the need. And it is our duty to make them understand. Again, most of the questions are which salt should be preferred. And we have uh, talked about <laughs> iron versus blood transfusion in severe anemia, pros and cons. Uh, I think we should persist with that WHO cutoff. There is nothing uh, more than that which has come up. Particularly in uh, uh, the the severely malnourished children, giving blood transfusion is sometimes detrimental because of the the uh, the overload, fluid overload that they have. And uh, it, 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 there are there is good body of literature showing that there is adverse outcome by giving a blood transfusion. 
So one has to weigh, and uh, there's nothing better than what WHO has recommended that four and six gram cutoff. And these are the cutoffs which are even followed in the textbooks. Then, uh, sir, in preterm, if you're giving iron at four week baby on EBM, so should it not be mixed with milk as it decreases absorption? <laughs> Can we give so it? I think, I think we have talked a lot, lot on this milk and interfering with iron absorption. See, breast milk, uh, uh, iron is better uh, available. That is one thing. Second, breast milk interfering with medicinal iron, at least, uh, uh, I, I think there, if you are giving some uh, 10 to 12 feeds, uh, how can you, uh, you know, make it away from the food? It has to be uh, around the milk time. But whatever is absorbed is absorbed. It is much better than not giving at all. Yes. So, any dose modification in hypothyroidism? I don't know what is the genesis of this question. <laughs> uh, oral <laughs> iron supplement to be started in low birth weight. Uh, what does the iron therapy should be started in preterm units? Again, most of the questions are yeah, for the preterms. Yeah. If the iron sucrose is advised at what age group, at what dose, and what duration? Iron sucrose is the IV therapy. We have mm -hmm. talked of the dose and uh, that is only a, a specific recommendation is there. A, a specific indication is there. A dose of prophylactic iron is again 1 to 2 milligram per kg. Per there are many preterm hormone flu formula. Most uh, colloidal iron. Why do all iron brand, brands contain folic acid? Any yeah. particular reason? <laughs> Actually, uh, this is uh, based on uh, some studies which were done in, I think, early 60s as a part of uh, looking at anemia in our country. And these were WHO-sponsored studies. And from there, it was seen that the, the uh, folic acid deficiency is uh, quite common. It was quite common at that time. Even B12 deficiency was common at that time. But what they saw that if they gave iron and iron folic acid and iron folic acid B12, then the iron, uh, uh, the, the, the correction of anemia or improvement was uh, most, the best with the iron folate supplementation. Addition of B12 did not make much difference. So as a public health intervention, iron folate combination was, uh, uh, made, uh, was prescribed. But somehow this is but somehow this is somehow this is continuing even uh, outside the the national programs. So most of the Indian mothers are iron, de iron deficient. Can we start uh, iron supplementation at four months in full term infants? The NNF has not recommended anything like that, and somebody has to look at the. In fact. Uh, uh, the the one reason why we are recommending at nine months of age, uh, as of now, under six months, the anemia prevalence is very uh, less, say about 10, 15 percent. The and above the age of one year, the above the age of six months, there is a lot of uh, 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 high prevalence, as we see in these uh, the the N uh, the NFHS uh, survey and CNNS survey. So that is why our group felt that probably the problem is occurring between six to uh, 12 months when the complementary feeding should be started, it's inadequate, improper, and that is why we have gone on to recommend nine months checking of anemia by hemoglobin, not a clinical assessment by uh, uh, by clinical assessment for pellet. So uh, unless we have data to and for for uh, uh, routine supplementation, if the prevalence is more than 40 percent in particular population, then only 40 percent or more then only the routine supplementation is uh, uh, advised. In, a, in under six months, that, uh, that uh, the prevalence is not that much. Is there any recommendation for zinc supplement along with the iron? No. In fact, uh, uh, when zinc supplementation for diarrhea came, there were a lot of literature on uh, it might interfere with iron absorption. It was the reverse. The iron, iron administration led to some malabsorption of zinc. So uh, as of now, there is no. There are I know there are some syrups available which do contain zinc, and they say that it it would promote the under promote the growth of the child better if you are giving zinc as well. But uh, there is there is no uh, 
uh, hard data on this that zinc supplementary should be given in ID. Any difference in dose for, of iron for prophylaxis in breastfed and bovine milk fed babies? I don't think in prophylaxis there is any such thing. No. Uh, will folate trap be a problem with iron and folate? Will folate trap folate trap uh, folate preparation? Yeah, uh, I think question uh, is who has Dr. asked. Dr. Prakash, are you there? Please raise your hand if you want to ask. Dr. Jay Prakash. I think he's in. Maybe we can answer. Uh, is there any need of iron supplements to leukemia, pediatric malignancy cases during treatment? If yes, no. uh, when to start iron supplements? No. Okay. There is no recommendation for giving iron uh, to these cases. We okay. we uh, see uh, these cases are given antifolate drugs. So if you are giving. Uh, we, we do prescribe some uh, B complex containing serums, but making sure that it does not contain folic acid because then the therapy would be interfered with. And uh, if there is a documented iron deficiency, if the patient is having anemia and there is documented iron deficiency, one has to give them, they, it has to be uh, pure vitamin, pure, pure iron, not iron folate. Yeah, without the folic acid. Yeah. Dr. Jay Prakash, you wanted to ask something? Yes, sir. Uh, so, giving iron with uh, folate will it will it cause folate trap uh, subsequent cobalamin deficiency? And I also would like to know whether whether the colloidal iron as propagated by some of the companies is it any way better than the conventional one? Colloidal iron is uh, effective, but uh, it's not better than uh, the other. As I said, actually, uh, the amount of work that India should have done on these preparations is not available, unfortunately. I could lay across, uh, lay hands on just about three, four studies in pediatric age group. One was on ascorbate versus uh, colloidal iron, and uh, I think another polymaltose complex uh, with something. So just, just two, three studies. One of them was by Dr. Vijay Yeble. So uh, this is uh, this does uh, has effect, but then cost factor comes, and the other was folate trap. Till now, it is not trapping. So. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe somebody will have to do good studies on that whether the the B twelve B twelve deficiency would increase if you are per giving uh, the the lot of uh, folate. Thank you, sir, for all the wonderful answers. Uh, if there is still any question, please share them in the group. Uh, we'll get them answered. Thank you very much. And your lot of your questions on folate, I think Dr. Pooja Diman, she is in the uh, the uh, audience here right now. So hey, she will be the when we are yeah, methodology discussing microscopic anemia, then we'll discuss. Yeah. Thank you so much thank, for a for thank a, you very much for a patient hearing. Thank, thank you. you, all the delegates, and thank you. Dr. Puja is there, she wished to speak. Yeah, yeah. No, so I was Dr. just Puja. heading to the folate trap that uh, it's the other way around that B12 deficiency leads to folate getting trapped. Yeah, but the yeah, that's well, right. I think it does not have any scientific basis. So we should not be thinking on those lines. But I first said that you never know if you study and you might get an answer to what you are thinking. But it's usually the other way around that B12 deficiency will lead yes, to... Yes, yes. Folate. folate trap is folate is trapped. So there's another trapping. question that should we give uh, stop iron supplements during fever episodes? I think for brief periods, it should be stopped. If, especially if you're giving antibiotics or something. So thank you once again. Uh, thank you all the faculty members and all the delegates. Uh, so we meet next time again at 9 o'clock uh, next Sunday.